I would like to introduce Dr. Trevor De Vries and Dr. Megan King, both of them from the University of Guelph in Canada. Trevor is an associate professor of the University of Guelph and he's the Canada Research Chair in Dairy Cattle Behavior and Welfare. He's done extensive research in behavior, nutrition, feeding and management. And Megan is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Guelph work, working with Trevor. And Megan delivered a webinar for us some time ago. So it's great to welcome Trevor and to have Megan come back. So Trevor, I can see you're online. I'll share presenter rights with you. Thanks, Nico, for the uh, yeah the opportunity to present as part of the uh, webinar here uh, today. It's a pleasure to be here with Megan and to talk about robotic milking in Canada and um, a little bit about uh, the situation and uh, some of the research that we've been involved in and where we're kind of planning to go. Uh, on that front uh, as well. Um, for uh, Is it down there? Many of you might not know that um, uh, first robotic uh, milking unit uh, was installed in Canada uh, in North America in 1999 in Woodstock, which is uh, about an hour from Guelph, uh, we're just a little bit north east uh, of Woodstock um, and that was in, in 1999, uh, so uh, um, a fair number of years ago already, uh, but over a, a very short period of time that number has climbed very quickly within Canada and we now have probably uh, by estimate well over a thousand uh, farms uh, milking with robots in Canada about 10% of our industry is, is currently milking uh, with, with robots. And this is just a, a map of Canada showing uh, the distribution of, of Canadian dairy farms with robots that are currently on milk recording. And so you see the, the number on the bottom left hand of the screen. Uh, we have 793 farms uh, that are in milk recording that are milking with robots. That's about 11% of our, our industry. Uh, currently, we sit at about 10,000 milking farms in Canada. And so the estimated total number of farms milking with robots, including those not on official test, is, is probably at about 1,000. And, and estimates would uh, put us at about 15% of our cows within the country are, are currently being milked uh, with robots. Uh, as you can see from the, the graph, we have a, a wide distribution across basically all the provinces that are milking cows. Um, you can see the number of farms and then the percentage of farms within each of those provinces that are milking with robots. Uh, some of those uh, at the low end, 5% and at the high end, uh, 30%. And with our primary uh, dairy regions of, of Quebec and Ontario, where the uh, majority of the farms in Canada are, uh, we're sitting right at about that 10%, 10-11% average that uh, I mentioned before. Probably the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest operations that we have in Canada is, is a farm that uh, started milking two years ago with 32 uh, individual uh, single box robots um, uh, milking about uh, 1,500 cows uh, two years ago. We have a lot of diversity in Canada in terms of size of farms milking anywhere from small uh, farms milking with a single robot, 30, 40 cows, uh, 50 cows, up to, uh, in this case, 1,000 cows, 1,200 cows, and, and 1,500 cows. And uh, more and more larger farms are moving towards that. However, I would say on average, the, the typical would be our, our still our kind of typical family farm, which would be typically about two or three robotic units. So milking anywhere from say 80 to uh, 150, 160 cows. We have some unique uh, uh, robotic milking uh, opportunities in Canada as well. Uh, Quebec, which is primarily still uh, tie stall farming. 90% uh, of the herds within Quebec are, are tie stalls. And within those tie stalls, we have uh, a fair number of them uh, operating with, with uh, a robot. So a, a, a retrofitted robot that actually moves down the tie stall, stopping at each cow 
and, and milking the cows individually within those uh, tie stall facilities. We also see some adoption of, of automated rotaries within the country now. Um, uh, there's, there's currently two uh, fully automated rotary parlors in British Columbia, and um, we're seeing more and more interest in, in moving towards that within the country as well. As I mentioned before, uh, the, the average uh, kind of robot milking farm in Canada would be about um, kind of that, that smaller family size uh, type farm, averaging about 136 cows. Um, the, the smallest average being out in, in the eastern uh, province of, of New Brunswick with about 91 cows on average, and the largest average robot farm in Canada is uh, at 192 cows in the province of Manitoba, which is interesting because that is also the province with the highest proportion of robots with about 30% uh, of all the farms in that province milking uh, with robots currently. So here we have a sh photo to show what a typical freestall barn in Canada looks like using free cow traffic. So in this case we have two robot rooms each having two robots um, so all of these cows in a, the main herd one large group each have access to any of the four robots um, they can also be sorted to the far side of the barn where they have a treatment group with stalls or a pack for fresh cows and lame cows as well they have swing gates so you can divide this main group into two if you wish they also use perimeter feeding uh, on the sides of the barn but some other setups that we have are central feed alleys where um, you feed down the middle and then your groups are separated, uh, one robot per pen on each side of the feed alley. We also have some retrofitted barns where producers have made their old barns work with the robots and this has saved them a lot of that upfront cost to do with the, the new barn and they can still manage cows well even with maybe older, smaller stalls, but it's working well for them. We have a great diversity in bedding and stall bases. So we have anywhere from mattresses and pasture mats with a small amount of bedding, such as sawdust, to our deep bedded stalls, which are the gold standard for cow comfort with sand. We also have a few compost bedded pack barns, although these are less common. And um, if maintained well, these are also great for cow comfort. One of the things that we wanted to highlight was some of the main drivers for moving towards robotic milking. And this was actually the focus of a large research study that we did a few years back already um, that was led by um, uh, researchers out of the University of Calgary, Dr. Ed Pager, and, and, and collaborations from a few other institutions, including ourselves at the University of Guelph. And, and um, it was primarily the research focus of a graduate student, Christina C. Um, and you can see the citations for a series of papers that came out of her graduate research. There's three papers cited here on the screen. And, and what we did in that study was at the time, we surveyed about a third of the producers. There's over 200 and, uh, it was 216 producers across Canada who are, have had adopted robotic milking, and we surveyed them about uh, some of the uh, challenges and opportunities associated with that change. And these are the, the first or the top three kind of areas where producers um, uh, mentioned their, their key drivers for, uh, for, for moving towards robotic milking. And, and I just wanted to go through those just to show how um, uh, or some of the responses that we received uh, in these areas. So first being improved profitability, quality of life, and less and or more flexible use of labor. And so here's uh, just the results from um, part of the survey. Uh, so again, uh, 217 producers, and, and we asked them on a scale of one to five, one being strongly disagree to five being strongly to agree whether or not robotic milking has improved their profitability. And, and interestingly, about 3.8 3 out of 5, so strongly agreeing um, uh, or agreeing to strongly agreeing, um, most uh, participants suggested that robotic milking had actually uh, improved profitability. Now, we didn't uh, quantify whether or not that was the case or not, 
and, and whether or not that's actually true. But the, the fact that uh, producers said that uh, suggests that there, there was some overall level of, of satisfaction with that uh, adoption of this technology. And, and in relation to that, we also asked them uh, whether or not it met their expectations, improved their quality of life, and improve their quality of lives of their cows. And, and that's really interesting because these are some of the strongest responses that we got were the fact that they said that they uh, moved towards robotic milking had not only improved the quality of their own lives, but also they had seen an improvement in the quality of, of their cows' lives. Another um, uh, perceived uh, uh, change that we, we asked about and producers responded uh, was in regards to production and, and specifically an increase in milk yield was perceived by 82% of the producers that participated in, in our study. And, and this was interesting because we also, in follow-up to this, it wasn't published, but we also then took their milking recording records and looked at whether or not that perceived change was actual, was an actual change, and whether or not their milk production actually did increase. And, and on average, uh, there was an increase across the producers. And, and so that was very interesting for us to see that the, the producers that uh, increased in production actually did increase. Uh, interestingly, those, those farmers that uh, decreased or, or stayed the same, uh, they also were, were quite right in terms of those changes that they, they observed um, uh, across, across, uh, across that change. When asked about the, the actual improvements in quality of life, some of the most common responses that we got were increased flexibility with time, work being less physical on their body, particularly those farmers who had moved from a tie stall situation where they're milking cows in the stalls to uh, loose housing and, and using robots, easier employee management, as well as improved herd health and overall better management. And 86% of the producers uh, suggested that they would be um, uh, willing to recommend transitioning to, to robotic milking to uh, other uh, dairy producers. We also asked about changes in labor and, and this uh, chart here just shows uh, broken down by herd size. So again, you can see the kind of typical herd sizes that we're dealing with. So fairly small to moderate size herds. And, and uh, at the top here, and what we uh, asked about was how the number of employees on farm changed as well as the time spent on milking related activities. And again, I think this is kind of interesting because uh, overall, uh, because these are smaller herds, there's not actually a large uh, employee base on the farms. But even within that, we still saw uh, a reduction of about a half a full-time equivalent employee reduction in labor across all farms. Uh, as well as a significant decrease in total time spent on milking related activities. However, to be pointed out, most producers suggested that their time became more flexible. It necessarily it didn't necessarily mean that they were actually working less on farm, but their time was more flexible. And so they could devote some of that time that they were spending on milking related activities to other things. Another area that uh, producers focus on was the fact that uh, cow health and reproduction might have uh, been improved with the adoption of robotic milking. And so again, we asked questions about uh, how uh, different uh, health conditions uh, as well as reproductive rates may have changed. And, and for the most part, um, uh, and, and we're pleasantly surprised to see that uh, when it came to health disorders, either producers for the majority said that they stayed the same or, or, or potentially even decreased. And, and this was kind of interesting, uh, particularly for something like uh, somatic cell count, where we, uh, we, there was initial reports where uh, some of that may have actually increased. However, uh, over time, it, it seems that with, with good management, uh, we should be able to actually improve uh, overall udder health in, uh, within those uh, facilities. And then similar with uh, reproduction as well, producers reporting improvements in, in um, uh, conception and, and, um, and, and no, say no differences actually in culling and longevity of their cows within their herds. And I think some of these changes in relation to health and reproductive management 
are tied in with the kind of the third area, which is the, the potential for improved herd management, uh, specifically the um, use of information, the data, the vast amounts of data that are being collected on farm and, and the use of that uh, data uh, for making decisions. And again, we asked producers about uh, some of those things. And, and again, uh, the majority of producers suggesting that uh, health management uh, was changed and, and in fact became easier in terms of health detection, uh, changes to heat detection and uh, their ability to uh, detect blame cows. And, and this has uh, been part of our focus, part of Megan's uh, uh, PhD research was really focused on some of these aspects of uh, our ability to say detect health changes within cows, within uh, robotic milking systems. And um, uh, this is just an example from uh, her PhD research, one of the studies that we conducted showing how um, we can use uh, indices of, of, of production and behavior to actually help us identify, say, animals that are, are becoming clinically ill. In this case, uh, looking at differences between milk yield and rumination time of cows that remained healthy in the days leading up to a diagnosis time point where cows that uh, were diagnosed with mastitis show a, a deviation um, anywhere from uh, a week to, to uh, 10 days, 14 days, as compared to their healthy counterparts within the herd um, in terms of a change in milk uh, yield and, and rumination time. And, and some of these indices are used in alert systems that are uh, present within uh, various robotic units. And, and that's again uh, an area of research that we continue to work on and Megan will describe in a minute as far as things that we're interested in uh, continuing our, our focus on. So that perfectly leads into some of the challenges experienced by Canadian farmers. So we're going to discuss um, the fact that farmers might be overwhelmed with data and alerts, some potential issues with feeding and also lameness. Um, so we're going to pair each of these challenges with some research we're working on and to start with the amount of data and alerts farmers are dealing with every day on top of their regular chores they're now managing cows and computers and there may actually be the case of too much data if it's not being uh, delivered and used efficiently by farmers a recent u.s study looked at disease alerts based on cow activity their lying behavior and their eating time those researchers found that 55 of those percents were perceived to be true by farmers, and farmers were only visually assessing cows based on 21% of those alerts. Producers were more likely to completely alert, uh, ignore alerts over time, and they were especially uh, like, uh, likely to ignore those alerts if there were too many of them. So they're more likely to think they're true and to actually check on those cows when there's fewer alerts each day. So something we've worked on is looking at changes in cow behavior and production that occur in the days leading up to their illness diagnoses. So as an example, we have cows with displaced abomasum from 12 days before they were diagnosed to uh, day zero, which would be the far right, and that is the day they're diagnosed. So looking at their rumination time in red, it's relatively stable up until a point eight days before uh, diagnosis when their rumination time starts to significantly drop off. Then four days later we actually see changes in their milk production. So what's interesting here is that the rumination time is giving you an even more sensitive earlier indicator than your production. So it might be good to look at rumination behavior as an indicator of illness. We saw this trend with many other types of illness, as well as differences in which types of information you're looking at, whether it be cow activity or conductivity for mastitis. Um, so we're always seeing rumination uh, responding earlier than milk, but we're also seeing differences between types of illnesses. So things like displaced abomasum, pneumonia, or mastitis, which have very rapid onsets and uh, acute symptoms, those are showing a lot more uh, stark, drastic changes in the cow's data, as opposed to something like lameness or ketosis, where a cow slowly enters that state. So what we're doing to improve this is uh, wanting to make these alerts more reliable and useful for farmers. 
either by refining the models already out there or building new ones using machine learning. Um, and so machine learning is essentially putting all of the possible data from as many farms as you can into a supercomputer and it comes out with the best possible algorithm for us to use. And we don't all, only want to make these algorithms, we want to test them before giving them to farmers to use. And so this includes looking for false positives and negatives and making sure that these are timely alerts for farmers. And we also want to give farmers the option to make it more or less sensitive depending on how they want to be spending their time. So if they're uh, wanting to take a few more risks and maybe not check as many cows, they can make it less sensitive. Or if they want to be checking more cows, um, they can do that as well. A, a second challenge that uh, has been identified by Canadian farmers and, and just in terms of um, serving uh, the industry as a whole is, is how to best still feed cows within robotic milking systems. And um, what we've discovered again through research uh, questionnaires as well as through uh, speaking to um, producers and, and nutritionists for the industries is there, there's still a real struggle with, with feeding strategy. Um, and, and again, because we, we, we've gone away from, uh, again, feeding cows as a group uh, to having the ability to control nutrition at a cow level and also realize that that nutrition is one of the primary drivers for getting cows to the robot. And, and so it can be very difficult to uh, manage some of the uh, interest, intricacies around that. And, and typically in Canada, uh, especially related to our farm size, um, we, we typically only have in a lot of these farms only one group of cows. And, and so often um, one ration or one base ration, a partial mixed ration for, for everybody uh, with, with varying levels of say concentrate at, at the robot. Um, but, but within that though, we still have some struggles in terms of um, uh, what, in terms of what are the best ingredients, uh, composition of robot pellet varies dramatically between areas within the country, between um, uh, what different companies, uh, uh, companies that are supplying those uh, concentrates or pellets have in, in terms of their theories around that whether or not we use alternative feeds and supplements. Um, there's a question of where, so how much uh, concentrate and, and levels should be provided at the robot or within the feed bunk or maybe even in separate grain feeders. We see that use within the industry as well. Uh, question of how much, again, um, how best to set up feed tables, uh, whether or not it's based on, on days in milk, whether or not it's based on stage of lactation or some uh, combination of the two. And then another question comes in is, is does this actually vary by cow differences? And this is a, a separate stream of research that we're getting into to actually look at not only cow differences from a physiological standpoint, but also from a behavioral standpoint. And we know that cows vary in terms of their individuality or even personality, we could say. And so whether or not certain cows require say, uh, different types of feeding strategies or even enticement to say go to a robot as it relates to feeding strategy based on their personality. And so we currently have one grad student, Anna Schwenke, who's working on that as part of her uh, master's research looking at that. And, and then another one that, that uh, I think still has a lot of promise in particular in robotic milking barns with the automation of milking processes is more automation within the feeding process itself too, not just at the robot, but with also at the feed bunk. And, and so we're seeing a lot of interest in Canada in terms of automating PMR mixing and delivery and, and more and more um, adoption of that within the industry as well. One of the big areas that we've been tackling from a research standpoint is uh, how we should be providing cows uh, concentrate at the, at the robot. And this is uh, a summary of, of uh, uh, five studies that have all been done in Canada. Uh, the first three actually done at the University of Saskatchewan led by Dr. Greg Penner uh, and, and his group there. And then two from, from my group uh, at, at the University of Guelph. And, and uh, what's interesting is we've been looking at different uh, strategies in terms of 
feeding cows different levels of concentrate within the robot uh, in, in different types of housing systems. So uh, at Saskatchewan in a guided flow system in, in uh, Guelph in a, in a free traffic system and, and looking at how changing concentrate levels not only impacts milking visits or not, but also particularly how it impacts overall nutrient consumption. And the, and the key variable that we've been focusing on is, is what we call this substitution ratio. And that's something that we see uh, quite consistency in a, lot of, in a lot of studies is that when we increase the amount of concentrate provided in a robot, we often see a substitution effect where cows will eat less PMR. And, and the challenge there is to minimize that and, and so that overall consumption levels do not uh, decrease. And, and what we see is that if we can keep that uh, substitution level low, as, as we've shown in a couple of studies that we've done, you tend to see improvements in, in cow performance within those systems. Another study that we're, we're working on currently uh, as it relates to feeding management is a large cohort study. We have uh, 200 Canadian farms enrolled in this across all provinces within the country. And you can see the distribution uh, representing the different brands of robots that are used across Canada. Uh, again, a wide spectrum of farm sizes from 38 milking cows to 1,000 milking cows. Just wanted to summarize, this works just in progress. This is a year long study, um, but from an initial survey that we did with these herds and visits we did last summer, I can say that they're, they're primarily free stall herds, mostly free cow traffic, and primarily feeding one or two PMRs on farm. Uh, where it's interesting, and this is something that we're trying to get after, is looking at the variation in robot feeding strategy. And what we see is a lot of variation, up to five different types of robot supplements used on, on some farms, um, including just a standard robot concentrate to people feeding, say, just high moisture corn, soybeans, roasted soybeans, flaked corn, beet pulp, soybean meal, ground corn, having separate pellets for their fresh cows, using liquid glycol or, or glycerin within the robot, as well as uh, liquid molasses. So lots of variation, and we're hoping to associate some of that variation in feeding practice with some variation in, in health and production across these farms uh, as, as it relates to the study. The last thing we want to highlight is some research we found that lameness is still affecting, on average, 26% of cows in each herd. So we looked at 40 herds in Canada, and it ranged from 2 to almost 60% of cows within each farm, but on average, a quarter of cows were lame. So we looked at the effects of lameness and how it was related to milk production, finding that, again, 26% of cows were lame, but only 2.2% of cows were actually severely lame. So as we look at that severe lameness prevalence and say we double it, so with two robots, uh, let's say you have 120 cows, instead of three of those cows being severely lame, it's now six cows. That is associated with a drop in milk yield per cow by 0.7 kilos per day, and also a drop of 39 kilos per day in milk for each robot. We also saw in that study that at the cow level, if you compare lean cows and, moder uh, and sound cows, even those moderately lean cows were showing decline in performance. They were producing less milk, they were being fetched more often, and they were being milked less often. So that's a, a very quick overview of a, a large amount of, of, of work and, and areas that we've been focusing on. Um, areas that we will continue to uh, direct our research moving forward, uh, as Megan mentioned already, so uh, machine learning for disease detection using multiple inputs uh, in terms of data that we can collect in terms of improving that detection models that we have. Um, uh, there's some work actually led by Megan as part of her postdoc looking at uh, the impact of, of adoption of robots in terms of stress. And, and farmer mental health. And, and so I uh, look forward to seeing some of the results from that. Uh, as I mentioned before, how best we can manage uh, feeding and, and efficiently feeding cows within robots. And then specifically focusing on uh, key areas of management, uh, particularly a transition, and I say both at calving and dry off. And we've got a large project actually evaluating how we uh, manage nutrition as well as robot settings at dry off to 
best improve that process and uh, have a positive impact on udder health in the next lactation. And so I um, hope you all uh, will uh, see the results of that research come out in, in the very near future. So with that, we thank you very much. We thank the funders of, of this research that we've described to you today and, and some of our efforts. And, and hopefully we uh, left a, a minute or two for some questions. Thank you very much, Trevor and Megan. I think it's been fantastic. The the not only the great amount of work that you're doing, but also the way you you tell the story of the journey that you've been on and and the findings that you've got. So I congratulate you on that one. A um, couple of questions that came through. One is, what do you see as the biggest challenge around data management, and how do you balance opportunity with those challenges? I think the biggest thing is to focus on what pr producers need and, and what do they want to see. And so just streamlining things to be um, just more easily accessible um, and keeping in mind their, their daily routines and what works for them. Excellent. So it's always about the question, not so much about the answer with the data. It always comes back to that same thing. Um, the other question probably, Trevor, for you is, um, do you see any variability in feed intake related to milking frequency? Um, very good. Yeah, very good question. And we've actually just been trying to explore that. Now, a lot of the kind of smaller controlled studies uh, we've, we've done um, where we have both concentrate uh, provided at the robot as well as PMR consumption, we don't have enough variation there to, to really look at that. And then in, in all the field studies that are done, we're missing a key component to that consumption, and that's the, the PMR consumption on an individual cow basis. Um, but we have collected some longitudinal data from our research farm um, where we have continuous or cows on the robot where we're continuously able to monitor not only their uh, pellet uh, provision at the robot, but we also have PMR consumption. And, and again, uh, this is a, a collaboration between ourselves and Dr. Uh, Greg Penner from Saskatchewan. We, we just actually presented this work last week at a meeting, uh, looking at some of those associations. And, and you do see there, there is an association there. Um, and, and we see uh, um, uh, positive uh, kind of associations between things we'd like to see, but we also see huge amount of variation within uh, kind of stages of lactation, even within um, concentrate level provisions, you'll see huge variations in PMR consumption levels. And, and I think that may have to do with uh, so, some individual differences and, and then also things like milking frequency differences. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's a good question that we probably need to explore a little bit more is how much uh, of that variation would contribute to some of the variation in intake that we see. Uh, so that's kind of my long answer to say that we, we have some of that data and we're working on it, but we, I don't have the exact answer yet. And I think that's fair enough, and I, and I think it is a complex issue to try to to see how, how do you simplify it down. Well, one of the discussions that happened here in Australia some time ago was if it was better to feed kind of a lot or, or, or very little concentrate in the robot when you have a PMR, with the concept that if you put a lot and cows don't go to the robot, the variability in intake of concentrate or grain will be higher, whereas if you put it in the PMR, the variability might be less, but on the other hand, you're not kind of fine tuning the, the, the allocation at an individual cow level, and you might be missing an opportunity there. But what are your thoughts behind something like that? Yeah, and, and, and I, I would agree with that. And, and, and we're seeing some variation too in, in response, although it's not consistent. And, and in that table I showed really quickly, one of the things that we're finding is that, yeah, we see a little bit of difference, say, between, say, our, our, our guided traffic systems versus our free cow traffic systems, where the guided systems, we, we can get away with potentially feeding at a lower level and not seeing as much negative consequence. However, um, we, we still see 
Um, a lot of in the free traffic systems, when we feed higher levels of concentrate, we still see a lot of variation. So your day-to-day -day variation in feed intake actually goes up. And, and so that becomes a challenge from a precision feeding standpoint, right? Because we, we, we're, we do it under the guise that we're, we are precision feeding, but then if the intakes actually become more variable day to day, which is something that we do see um, both at a, a concentrate and PMR level, uh, then that can be a challenge for us. And, and so we're, we're still kind of working on that uh, in terms of minimizing that variation. And that's where what we've discovered is, is um, regardless of how much concentrate we're providing within the robot, it all comes back to management of the PMR and, and consistent high consumption levels of that PMR. And, and in turn, what we see is that uh, the feeding behavior of that is actually gonna dictate the milking patterns of the cows and, and actually have a positive impact from that, from that perspective. And so we, uh, we can never um, think about the, the dietary strategy as two separate components. We should actually be viewing it as, as one component, um, basically one diet that we're kind of delivering in two parts. And, and we need to um, make sure that uh, we don't forget about uh, one part uh, over against the other. Yeah, for us here in grazing, it's sometimes even a bit more complicated because you add the grass variability into it and also the feed stations. And that starts putting a little bit more kind of pressure on the variability around those aspects. But, but I, I do agree with you that you've got to look at the total kind of ration yeah. or yeah, feeding yeah, from yeah. one. And the more, and the more like in your situation there too, and, and, and just even uh, on, on a lot of traditional grazing farms that are parlor milking, you see the same thing where you have uh, actually various, so many different types of feeding strategies that you, you have a greater risk of that variation coming in, right? Um, and, and so that was one of the fail safes of a, of a, of a complete TMR feeding system is, is that you've, you've got a, a complete diet that is homogenous and, and should be eaten consistently. But the minute you split that into two, maybe three components, we, we increase the risk of variation and, and that becomes a greater um, a kind of bottleneck in, in a lot of situations that, that needs to be overcome. Yeah. Megan, last question for you. The, was the 26% of lameness determined by farmers or was it determined by a trained observers? Because what we see here is that lameness drops, but farmers normally do not diagnose lameness properly, particularly subclinical lameness. Yes, I totally agree. That 26% was determined by me after substantial training. And I would agree that farmers are definitely noticing those severe cases of lameness and they're doing a good job of treating those. But what they don't pick up are those mild limps because um, it might just be a shifting baseline or you know that that cow's old or she just walks a bit off, right? Um, but yes, that was determined by me. Excellent. So, so I consider yourself a trained observer. <laughs> I so, like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, and, and that's where I think the, the previous presentation by Yanni Garcia from Sydney Uni, talking about cameras to detect lameness. I think that, that those is when you start putting all those technologies together, is what, what benefits can you start getting from all of that kind of integration of pulling everything together. And so Megan and Trevor, thank you very much for your time. It's been a, a real pleasure. To, to have you both here today, sharing your knowledge and insights. So is there any last thing that you would like to add or comment? I just wanna say thanks to the presenters so far. I've really enjoyed it. Good. Excellent. Thank you once again, Nico. No worries. Thank you for your time and we'll be in touch.